G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm interviewing Sam Dieback from the PR Hub. She's based in Sydney, Australia. Thanks for your time today, Sam. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Troy. Let's start with how we know each other. Like we said before we hit record, sounds like it feels like we already know each other because you send us a shit ton of great guests to have on our cast um, because that's your, your job is PR or public relations. So thank you very much. Yeah, we were. Um, yeah, I was telling you that I was laughing at a previous episode with one of our clients, Ben Lipschitz from Food by Us, who said, well, that's her job. And I was like, <laughs> that's really Ben. He's very direct um, and he's an absolute, he's an absolute pleasure to work with too. And tell our audience a bit about your business, what it does and how it makes money. Yeah. So I look, the reason why we do send you lots of guests um, is because that's our bread and butter. So at the PR Hub, we work really closely with business founders, industry leaders, CEOs. Uh, they're all leading very successful, um, disruptive, high growth companies, often driven by technology. And what we do is, is that we ingrain ourselves in their businesses as an extension of their team. We understand their strategy. And then we build a comms piece, a public relations uh, strategy around that. So we're very much, we're passionate storytellers. We're great connectors. We get the media. We love, we love the media um, and we love getting our clients out there. And just to be clear, you're not focusing on tech but it sounds like that's a preponderance of who you work with because i had a great guest that i recorded would uh, went, would have went live last week arjun uh he was he's a one of the few buyers advocates here in australia um so it's not just tech companies that you deal with yeah, and, and I'm biased. Arjun is, is fabulous. Shout out to Arjun and Investor Kit. Um, yeah, it's interesting though. I was talking to uh, my leadership team about this the other day and, and what is a commonality between all our clients is that there is a technology piece. They're all technology driven. So another client of ours is called Taxibox. They do mobile storage um, and they, uh, they've got a really big technology piece behind that that has allowed them to scale and operate as one of the biggest providers in the country. But you wouldn't call them a technology business. Uh, but technology is certainly a very important aspect, I think, for any business these days. You know, I've asked this before of guests who do use PR as part of their marketing because I think a, a lot of it's a misconception. People think PR is dead or dying. But clearly not um, the size of your team. I had a look on the website uh, is quite big now. We'll get into that in a minute. But um, clearly you're very busy with um, this part of marketing. Yeah, and I think that's the other one is that there's, I haven't heard the PR is dead thing for a while, although I used to, you know, that was certainly, I have heard that in the past. And I used to, I used to think, oh, am I doing the right thing with this business earlier on? Uh, but the other big misconception around PR is that PR and marketing are the same function. Hmm. And we can talk about that a little bit later, but, you know, even in the past 12 months, I've realized that we assume a lot of knowledge in our business, even because I think we work with such successful, smart people. And there's all automatically, we make this assumption that people think, know the difference between PR and marketing. Uh, but from PR perspective, like we do things a little bit differently in our business. Uh, it's very much about what they call sort of earned media, which means that there are opportunities that we're driving that are not paid pay for. So you can't take out and we don't take out ads or we don't place editorial features. Everything, predominantly everything that we do is called earned media. Um, PR is definitely not, not dead, uh, but there's so many different streams of PR these days as well and, and different organisations doing it differently. Yeah, great. And how did you start out? This business was a bit of a, a side hustle, side project uh, almost 10 years ago. Um, I you know, should probably just go back a little bit. So my background was in building businesses, uh, in business strategy, in brand marketing. I worked with an amazing founder very early on in my career when I was at university. That was my first sort of real job out of uni for a company called NADS Hair Removal Gel and working with the founder, Sue Ismail. And it was that there was so much grounding there for what we do as a business today. It was all very much about learning about how do you build a story around the person that started the business? How do you look at the why? What problem are they solving? But why are they so passionate about actually doing it? Because most entrepreneurs, and you would know this from talking to them all the time on the podcast, Troy, is that they don't start a business to be famous. 
They certainly, they might be thinking about money, they might be thinking about freedom, flexibility, but they're also thinking about how do I use my knowledge? I'm passionate about an industry. I can see a problem right now or a gap in the market. I've got the solution or I, I, I'm going to find the solution and develop it and build it. So that's sort of where I started. This business, I, you know, I've got quite a, quite a like lot, lot of, um, I guess, scars, pain, pain points, lot, lost money along the way in different businesses that I was involved with. But I got to the point in 2013, yep, so 10 years ago, where I was working with a former New South Wales Liberal leader called Kerry Chikorovsky, and we had been in a business previous to that uh, together. And then I ended up working in her lobbying business, a government relations business. And through that experience, I really I recognised that my passion for working with very smart industry leaders and entrepreneurs um, that that was what I loved was being able to work with them, understand their strategy, understand what they were good at, understand what they wanted to achieve, and then go right. I'm going to help you tell that story, and this is how we're going to do it. So the PR hub was like this side project that I did, and then in 2016, when I had my daughter or having my first daughter Misha, I decided to go full time with the business at the same time as becoming a mum. Right. So you're a masochist. Um, I would never, ever do it again, obviously. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I highly, I would, you know, it's one thing that I say, I would never recommend uh, not taking proper maternity leave, yeah. uh, which I did it because I was none the wiser. Yeah, great. And maybe just touch on the other businesses you had and did you exit those, I assume? Uh, yeah. So when I was 23, that was when I was working in brand marketing at the time. That was when I started or co-founded my first business, and it was in the organic skincare um, and pharmaceutical space, and I had three other co-founders. I was a really naive and ambitious, um, but not not particularly bright in some aspects and not very confident 23-year-old. So I took out a bank loan to put money into this business, but I was still a minor shareholder. Uh, so I didn't have a lot of say in that business and also was really fearful about voicing my opinion because I thought I knew nothing compared to these, you know, these much older people that I'd started that business with. Uh, great experience, travelled the world, launched it in lots of different countries, but ultimately the major shareholders had a falling out and um, the business folded. I spent some time in TV, working in marketing and sponsorship. Um, then I started a personal training business. I got burnt in corporate. And so I started a personal training business in my mid twenties and at the same time went into business with somebody else. And we had an events and catering company. So this was all in the Northern beaches of Sydney, where I lived at the time. Uh, absolutely loved it. it. Was a It was a fun lifestyle, made some good money. But after a couple of years, I actually just started getting bored. Yeah. Like mentally, the stimulation wasn't there. And I realized that I had to pivot and do something different. Yeah. Great. Now, being in PR in Sydney, I'm assuming you know Stu Gregor? I do not know Stu Gregor. Okay. He's one of the founders of uh, Four Pillars Gin. And okay. he had a he had a PR agency in Sydney there, uh, I think near where, I can't remember what suburb it is, where Archie Rose is. Is it Just... Newtown? Newtown? Yeah. Is it Newtown? Roselle? Not Roselle. I feel Roselle. Like... I think it's Roselle or Newtown. You're right. So it's just down the road from Archie Rose Distillery. So it's true. Yeah, great guy. I sat on the Australian Distillers Association Committee with him, but he had a PR business with about 23 staff in it until uh, Four Pillars got invested in by Lion Nathan. So he quit that day job a couple of years later and just focused on the, on the gin. I thought you might have known him, but obviously not. I know of the brand and I'm pretty sure I've drunk it on occasions. So started PR Hub in 2013. How, how old were you then? Um, I was 33. Yep. And do you have some key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth of the business over the last 10 years? So we, I think you were saying before that you're looking at our website. Um, so at the moment in terms of staff, we have 11 full-time staff. We also have a um, regular, like a regular group of contract writers who work with us closely across our accounts, we also have photographers and videographers across the various cap cities that we work with, again, because great imagery is a critical part of PR. Um, so certainly, like, the business has grown a lot in terms of people these days, which is really nice to see. It's been, it certainly hasn't been easy, and COVID, as it was for a lot of businesses, was really tough for us in those first initial couple months where we dropped close to about 80% in revenue wow. in those first couple of weeks in 2020. I actually was pleased because I thought it was going to be closer to 95%. Um, it was it was a really tough time, but I also 
remember speaking to a couple of my clients who'd lived through the who, who had businesses through the GFC. They gave me some great advice. And I and I sort of had to take the perspective that this wasn't a reflection on our quality of work or our business model, it was happening to everyone. Um, and it was just like dig dig deeper and, and you know, work your ass off basically. Um, and we were fortunate that we worked quite, had quite diverse experience in PR and we weren't a PR agency for travel, lifestyle, fashion brands, uh, which were really suffering at the time. We worked with a lot of technology-driven businesses and tech and e-commerce really accelerated during that COVID period. So for us, we were fortunate from that perspective, um, and the business grew 70, 74, 76% year on year, wow. um, 2021, 2022, which was a really, really good achievement, um, really good achievement. And again, I think, you know, this year we've had about 40% year on year growth in terms of revenue, and the team has more than doubled in size in the past 12 months. So there's some, I guess, some initial key metrics, which, I mean, they sound okay. Hmm. They sound great. Well done in the last 10 years. Yeah, thank you. It's it's been been a journey, but um, I've enjoyed most of it. And was it just yourself when you started out, one full time equivalent? Yeah. So when I started it, I was working um, working with Kerry Chagrovsky, and I stayed working in government relations for about three years. And I and I stayed working in that business, and then ran this business on the side. Um, I, you know, I love business. Uh, business was everything. To me, like business, people say business was my baby. Um, you know, then my then my human baby came along and changed my world. Uh, but yeah, it was, you know, I put lots of hours into working, worked really long hours, um, and then yeah, developed it to where it is today. When was the moment you felt like you had succeeded? Um, we were talking about this, weren't we? Just before, before yeah. we started chatting, I I always stumble a bit on this question. Um, but, you know, we were also talking about actually stopping and going, well, it's okay to see little moments, I think, of success. Do I think I've succeeded in life as yet? Absolutely not. But I guess there have been little moments along the way. Um, you know, I look at my team today. I look at coming through the pandemic in the past few years. Yes, we had a great business model, but hiring great people has been really tough for us keeping up with, you know, the keeping up with demand for our services. And, and I find that has been super stressful for us. So to get to a stage, I guess, where we've got a really solid team that's growing um, and a really good culture, to me, that's success, a little bit of success if I look back on where we were three, four years ago. Um, uh, when else did I think I'd succeeded? I don't know. I think I think it depends what day of the week it is or what month it is and um, what's going on as to how you answer that. Spoken like a true business owner. <laughs> what does success look like to you? Another really good question and another really hard one to answer. Um, look, success is success. You know, pe people come back to money. Um, yes, you need money to live and to have a lifestyle, but it's never been the key driver for me in building businesses. Um, and sometimes that's been to my detriment as well um, because I haven't focused enough on the numbers and I've had advisors come in and, and sort of whip me into shape on that one. I think that's been a really good learning. But in terms of success, I think it's ultimately loving what loving what you do and also having a positive impact. So the work that you do, is it helping change, I don't know, people's lives or society for the better. And I guess with the work that we do, that's very much about telling our clients stories because they are delivering products and services that are disrupting industries and are changing things for the better. So our job, you know, the success for me is, you know, we have a bell in our office and we ring it. Whenever anyone gets a great, you know, like media opportunity or in an interview, the bell gets rung. Um, and, and I tend to get very excited about the little things like that, like those little pieces of success rather than big pieces of success. Number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast growing business? Um, make sure you put some time into working out what your key message is and what your branding, what your branding piece looks like. Really don't skip that. Sometimes people are very quick to just go, I'm going to go and launch a business. Uh, but I haven't really thought through what it is the best way to sell that to my audience because the audience need to care. They need to understand the why. And usually it's not why you think it's great. It's you've got to put yourself into their shoes and go, why would people buy this product or buy this service? So if you get that piece right, then 
you set yourself on a path to to success, I think. And then depending on what the business is, you can you don't have to in like pay for an agency to help you in those early stages, especially when you are struggling, you know, you are tight on cash. Uh, but start to look at networking. So get yourself out there, go and meet people, meet people within the industry that you operate in, send emails, call people, make a list, um, use social channels that are relevant again to your business and your audience. That's usually, it's not going to cost you much money, but it is about creating, I guess, a bit of a plan and a roadmap about what the content looks like. And that's a really important point to make sure your messaging is clear because I think as business owners, we can just vomit into a document all about us and our business and uh, without a skilled person that can help you craft those words, whether it's a PR agency like your own or a copywriter, that can be really powerful, a small change and a small investment of time and money to get that messaging right. So your um, target customers understand how you can help them very, very quickly. Yeah. I mean, I've worked with so many business owners over the years um, and they suck. Like, the, you know, we suck. Like I, I, I do as well. Like get me to start writing about my business or my story and I just go blank. Yeah. It's because, and and so it's just that you might want to work with a media trainer as well, but it's understanding that very much the way that you describe it or the technical jargon or what you think is important isn't necessarily going to be important to the people you ultimately want using what you've got. Yeah. How did you fund the business? Uh, it's funny, you know, because when I started, when I started what is now the PR hub, um, I had about oh, 70, 80 grand's worth of credit card debt. Yep. So, so I, I didn't fund the business off a credit card. Um, I just had a bad experience in, in the business I'd been in previously, lost a lot of money, was was not managing my finances very well as well. I have to put my hand up on that and, and everything sort of spiraled out of control. Um, so it's just very, it's been very organic, you know, people use the word bootstrapped. Um, but yeah, it's always just been through, you know, the, the hustle of bringing in clients and then putting money back in and, and just going that way. Yeah, it's, it is quite common for small business owners to leverage their credit card, uh, for, for that initial debt to get going. I had Carolee Fontanelli episode 71 a couple of years ago now. Awesome. Kiwi, she moved to Sydney, um, and uh, she's got a great law practice there, focusing on family law, helping with you know divorces, separations, et cetera. But she started with, she inherited almost half a million dollars in debt in her ex-husband's sole law firm and took it on and paid it off within three years, just worked her ass off, worked hard and smart, obviously. So it's not that uncommon, Sam. Yeah, look, it was just part of my journey and and I just had to deal with it. You know, it sort of got myself into that position and I don't know I was the person that just went, well, I have to, it was really hard. It was it was very hard, you know, but it was fortunate that I was able to pick up some jobs and, and work with a few people and, and really tighten the purse strings from a personal perspective and, and build it from there. And haven't taken investors on along the way? No, no investment. Um, always open to opportunities on that front in terms, you know, I've, it, it, you know, we've got a lot of businesses that do raise capital um, and undoubtedly it does help scale those businesses a lot faster, uh, but it's not something that I've ever done to this point in time. Yeah. Do you have a, a, a number in mind of team members you, you'd want to get to? So we would like to double in the next 12 to 18, well, actually, sorry, 18 to 24 months. The business has the targets of doubling the size of the team at the moment and tripling revenue. Yep, great. Yep, so it sounds like capital might be needed if you're going to do that, but there's heaps out there. There's government grants, there's bank finance. I'm not sure if you've looked at, but um, yeah. If you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? Actually, you know what? I probably wouldn't. I don't know if that was the answer you were expecting. Oh No, it just sounds like you've got such a passion for PR. I thought you would, but you'd. I um I I don't really call myself a publicist anymore. I have a passion for PR in the sense that it's all about building relationships and connections and networking and helping great people get their products and services out there on a broader scale so those businesses can grow. Um that's my passion. My passion is very much about business building and connecting. One of the things that that I think that we do exceptionally well is connect our clients. So, you know, where where I see opportunities because I love 
spotting opportunities and making them happen um, is seeing an opportunity for, for our clients to partner or to collaborate or, or for them. That's the magic for me. So, and, you know, we have the opportunity to work with so many really impressive people across a variety of industries like property you mentioned before, but funds management, investing, digital consulting, hospitality, tech, sports tech. There's so many great businesses like coming out of nowhere at the moment that I almost feel like I would want to test myself and do something different because I love a great challenge. Um, And so if I went back into PR, I'd be kind of doing the same thing as where I think I'd want to do something completely different and go, okay, you got to try and do something new. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? Um, growing a team. <laughs> yep. As you, I know you listen to the cast. You hear me say often, I think people are the hardest thing in small business and where the value is at. Yeah, I mean, PR is a service-based business. We're a service provider. Um, so the technology driver in our business is quite minimal. Um, so it is, it's all about people and it's all about, being, you know, being a good leader as well. It's not just the people that you bring into the business, but it's also about how do you evolve as a business founder or a CEO in that role, because that has a lot to do with how you shape and grow the team. But yeah, that's that would be the number one challenge by far. What area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? I mentioned before that piece around sort of not valuing the work that we did early on or and again maybe it's that confidence piece like not having the confidence that the work that we were doing could match our competitors or you know I'll just give them this price because I really want to work with them or we really need the revenue right now or I hate saying no uh, to new business and it's sort of working through that journey as a business founder in your head so um and you know I've had a business of had well, I do have a business advisor now uh but my first business advisor who'd worked with some of our clients um he was absolutely brilliant in that space really like an absolute taskmaster uh but he would keep me accountable which you also need as a founder in business because you don't have that especially as a solo founder which is what I am uh but he was like you are way undercharging like what is this you're never going to grow this business you're never going to be able to hire staff if you keep charging these these really ridiculously low amounts and also the other thing that I've been terrible at but get better at is doing favors for people mm. so because you know I love this person again I was saying I'm a relationships person and a, a network and I don't like missing opportunities but I'd be like yeah yeah like I'll just help you do that yeah yeah okay no no leave it with me I'll write up a press release no I'll call some journos I'll help you with your messaging The problem with that is, is that all of that adds up with time and there's only so much time in a day. And if you're not focusing on the things that are bringing in the revenue, you actually can't grow your business. Absolutely. And I made that mistake early on about not pricing or valuing our services, Uh, our web design development company in Melbourne that we started late 99. Our accountant said to us, you've got to raise your prices. We said, we can't, we're going to lose clients. And he said, exactly, you're going to lose the wrong clients. Some, Some of the arsehole, you know, don't pay their bill or the haggle. So we did that a few months later, we said it again, and we pushed back. Of course, we raised our prices again until we we got to the level. And that's one of the first things I look at when I'm helping small business owners is their pricing. And a lot of it is their their mindset around. They don't think they're worth that. And you need to be charging what the market will bear, obviously. And um, especially in a services-based business, as you said, you can't leverage a product or a technology. So you've got to be really clear on you know, financial modeling of of billable hours and average rates, et cetera, to make sure you're going to get the return that you, you deserve in the business. Yeah, 100%. Like it's definitely one of the biggest things I had to get my wrap my mind around. And the other the other piece to that is just to say no. And as you said, Len, what your accountant said is brilliant. Like uh, those, those sort of that low-hanging fruit, the ones that aren't paying as much are usually the heart. Like they usually end up being the harder clients to please and harder clients to work with as well. And, and one of the challenges for me, like a few years ago now, was actually splitting up or breaking up with clients. That was the other learning. And oh, that was that there were some challenging moments there too, because it's never easy. It's hard. It's not me, it's you. <laughs> um, have you read the book uh, Managing a Professional Services Firm by David H. Mesa? I have not. I'll shoot that through to you later, but that might be a good one to read to help understand, you know, professional services. So he talks about law firms, accounting firms, but anyone that's really selling time, it's a great book. It's written in the 90s. Right. Yeah, thank you. What have you enjoyed the least about managing fast growth? Having to work on weekends. (laughs) (laughs) Um, 
don't you subscribe to that saying that you know you, you're a business owner you get to choose the hours you work those 80 hours yeah look there's there's an element of truth in that of course mm. right but you've got to find the hours somewhere else so i might have a bit of flexibility my daughter's six now i might have a bit of flexibility about being able to pick her up for school but the reality is she still has to go you know she still does do after school care a couple of days a week um but yeah you still have to find those hours somewhere else and I you know over the years like you know I do put in and and this would not be uncommon to a lot of founders is that you do put in the hours whether it's late into the you know late into the evening early morning for me it's it's been often like most Sundays most people you know I don't talk about that on social media necessarily but generally Sundays is my day to work uh, and I think it, at some point I really need to move away from that, not just because, you know, I don't particularly enjoy doing it all the time, but it's actually not healthy. Yeah. What do you love most about growing a small business? The people. Mm. Um, it's funny because we're talking about what was the hardest thing before we're talking about team, but at the same time, really it is about the team. Like I, there's times where I've worked, walked into the office and we have a pretty full office now. Um, and it's just, it brings such a smile to my face to go, wow. And I guess that's that success piece, but you don't automatically go, oh, success. But to walk in and see the team and see the vibrancy and people collaborating amongst each other and and me sort of taking a step back and it not being necessarily about me, but seeing this sort of model that I thought might work actually working is like that, that to me is, is a lot of joy. What has been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? Uh, valuing, we talked about this before, but I would say very much valuing what we have to offer and, uh, yeah, putting confidence behind that. And if people don't want to pay that or they want to haggle for price, it kind of kind of gives you an insight, I think, around whether you would culturally be aligned to work together as, a, as well. Um, and and part, I guess the next bit of that is saying no. Like the mindset of saying you don't always have to say yes to everything that looks like an opportunity that knocks on the door or walks in the door. And that's still a hard one for me to this day is that I'm like, yeah, but like we can make it work. But, you know, like I'm the glass like half full type person. I'm like, no, no, but we'll find a way. And sometimes I just have to go, you know what? No. Mm. Yeah. So again, same. I said yes to everything. Over promised, under delivered, got a bad reputation and learned the hard way. So probably 10 or 15 years ago now, I'm, I'm much better, but still have to work on it every day to say no to the wrong things. Mm. The number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? Structure and consistency. Is that true? Um, but yeah, stru- look, structure. And, and just, uh, yeah, structure in terms of you have to be very disciplined in terms of how you carry out your day and where you spend your time. Uh, that's that's a really big one, the time one, especially as you grow, you've got to get smarter and more um, protective of the time and where you spend it. Jump over to growersmallbusiness.com and leave your details to get a short two-minute email I send on Fridays to help small business owners like you become better leaders. I include some reading or professional development resources I've discovered in the last week. Can you talk to how you've added people to the team, some wins, mistakes and advice for those listening? Yeah, plenty of mistakes, I guess. Like I, I'm I'm not a recruiter. Um, <laughs> made some terror, like just interviewing people like years ago I had no idea what I was doing asked all the wrong questions didn't know what I was looking for again if you're growing really fast which we have been for several years particularly a couple years ago it was sort of like yep we'll just hire that we'll just hire them yeah yeah they'll be fine they'll fit in Um, absolutely terrible decision in a business you know there's that saying of like hire slow fire fast Uh, and I'd have friends of mine and and clients of mine who I'd speak to about those problems and and they'd say the same thing and I'd be like yeah shit damn like <laughs> yeah 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 I did that again didn't I so I think that's that's certainly been a really big learning point for me and it's also about bringing other people into the recruitment process so we have a process in our our business now where I'm never involved in the first interviews they're done by our managing director and then they would come to like come to me as a second round interview then we might do some sort of testing whether it's personality testing or get them to do a task and then obviously you've got to check uh, referees as well but just having that system there um 
for on and then the system for onboarding. I think that's the other really key thing is that once you get people into your business, what does the onboarding process look like? Yeah, I totally agree. That's something I think small business owners miss. This is a great opportunity. I love that saying, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. And that goes for new team members as well, because it's their first day. They're excited. You know, when I was working or managing companies, I, I made it a, a thing that every team member, didn't matter how big our business got to, 30 or 40 staff, take them out for a coffee on that day, run through our vision, mission, core values, our history, where we're going, and, and then let them ask any questions, obviously. But that is a huge, huge thing that, and not much time needed to be invested by the business owner, but really powerful. Mm, yeah, and it's and it's tricky when you are in such a high growth environment, when it's really fast paced and you're growing really quickly and you've got new clients and you've got new people starting and you're training, like it, it is, and it comes back to what I was saying before, you need to find that structure and that discipline about how you spend your time and make sure it's in the right place. And back on recruitment, uh, I believe that's the most important thing a manager does because if you don't get A players on the bus, you know, you have assholes there making the culture really toxic and you, then your A players are going to leave. But I certainly, none of us, any of our businesses early on knew anything about recruitment. I don't think we could even spell it. And so we should have invested more time learning about what is rec good recruitment, what does it look like and the tools, et cetera. So um, we think most small business owners just don't invest enough time in that same as marketing. So we, yeah, we put together a two week short course for exactly that, the ultimate recruitment toolkit to help some small business owners make a start and head, head in the right direction on recruitment and get it right. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where you don't you don't really necessarily know the value of it. Because when you start a business, there's so many things you don't know. Yeah. You're not you're really focused on the product or the service and what you're passionate about. And then you're like, oh crap, I actually have to learn all these other things if I actually want to scale this. And recruit, like you said, recruitment, marketing, PR, they're sort of like, oh, okay, yeah, um, I guess that they're important. Um, but 100 percent agree with you about recruitment. It's just, it's so critical. And, I, you know, I know from personal experience when we've had a really toxic person in the team, that breaks my heart. Like it's, you know, you just see one person and it's spiraling and you're like, oh, my goodness, we've, you know, we've built this thing and everyone else is doing a great job and there's this one, but it only takes one. That's right. What are some of the things you recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? Um, again, what you said before, starting sort of with that onboarding process. Very much it's those first impressions, bringing that person into the team, making sure that you're constantly, um, and this is something I've learned over the years as well. Like, again, it's one of those things that you don't get taught how to be a business owner um, or you don't get taught how to build a great culture or what's right or what's wrong. or And so it's a lot of trial and error. Um, but I have learned over the years, it's that repetition of what is our vision. Bring the team into the, like, you know, we reset our values at the end of the year before last uh, a lot they didn't change a lot but we just felt like it was a good time to reset and bring the existing team in to help you know determine what are our values these days because they're probably a bit different to when I set them six or seven years ago on my own uh, but bringing them into strategy sessions um, we do that as well we have a business advisor and he works with us every couple months as a team he works a lot more with me like one-on-one -on -one. But we will have those group sessions where we talk about the vision. We talk about what we've achieved. We talk about where we want to go with the business. Um, absolutely critical. I think the other thing is to make sure you're having fun. Mm -hmm. That's one of our core values is fun. Mm. Yeah. And make sure you do, you know, you regularly do have fun because the majority of us work in high paced um, environments where there is a lot of work and we do have a lot of responsibilities. And so you've got to make sure there's a bit of balance there to um you know not just always be working and head down hello audience how you've handled balance personally yeah <laughs> next question <laughs> um oh it's look I, I think i've got i've gotten much better at balance in terms of being more present uh as a mother when I started the business, oh, sorry, when I became a mum, I was very focused on business. I thought I'd be on a plane the next week after giving birth at a, you know, an opening of an office with a minister in Melbourne for a client and my whole like world just, I just shut down. And, and that was extraordinarily, extraordinarily hard for me. And I was not great at being a mum. Um, I still focused very much on business. So I found a lot more balance in that respect and I love it. I actually, you know, I love being a mom and, and um, so that's, there's balance there in terms of personal, like 
my personal like life. Somebody asked me this a few weeks ago. They're like, they see me on social media and they said, you do so much. How do you fit it all in? Like, you know, your, you know, your life looks amazing. You've got all this blah, blah, blah. And I went, well, it's social media for one, but two, like my personal life sucks. Like, cause outside of business and family and being a mum, there's not a lot that goes on. So. How much professional development have you invested in yourself? Um, I, I, I haven't done so in the last, I don't know, three to six months. Having said that, I've got a business advisor and I have had for about three years. And that's been a really big thing for me uh, to have that person, that sounding board, the person who's like keeps me accountable, says stuff that I don't always like hearing. To me, that's very much about helping me grow as a business leader. A few years ago, I did the Australian Institute of Company Directors course because one of my longer term goals is to actually become like to sit on boards because I love the strategy piece and and being able to like advise on businesses so for me I set out and did the course I think it was three maybe four years ago now um so that to me was like that was intense and I hate exams um and it really tested me again but I like to challenge myself and so that that was a really good thing and I'm glad I did it then because I, I don't think I'd have the capacity to do it now. Um, but ongoing, like we, you know, like I will look at courses. Um, again, I'm looking at, I'm joining EO, which is the nurse organization, uh, because we have some amazing clients who have been and are in EO. I've had experience with EO in the past. Um, and for me, again, it's sort of like surrounding myself with those people who are in similar situations where I can also give back, I guess, a little bit about what I know in my space, but being able to learn from them professionally to help take my business to the next level. Yeah. Just back on your point on your uh, your ambition to sit on boards, I started chairing my first board about seven years ago, um, and I love it. It's just great. I got out of my last operational role about three years ago. So being on a board or chairing a board, you can give your opinion. It's up to the leader of the business to execute day to day. You don't have to worry about all the shit that goes on. It's a lot of fun, and I'm getting a lot more value out of that role rather than being in the business these days. Yeah, look, I mean, when I worked with Kerry, um, I managed a lot of her board appointments. Like that was part of my role very early on. So I would look at the board papers, like, you know, obviously she wouldn't say too much, but I would see things. And, and it just really fascinated me how you can have an external, sort of an external group, right, of advisors and people who have the smarts and the skill set and the experience that can assist the businesses with their growth. And for me, that's, you know, that's very exciting. And you've mentioned um, coaches. Any, any other advice or comments around mentors or coaches? Oh, you know, when, when I, you know, growing growing up, um, in those early years of building my career in my 20s, uh, I didn't have any real mentorship or guidance or leadership. And I really, you know, I've done okay, I've done all right, but I think I could have achieved so much more if I had the opportunity to have that external advice. And again, like I just didn't know and, and the people that were around me weren't particularly great advisors. I thought they were at the time, but then I realized that actually it was the complete opposite. So as I've built out my journey, like I spend a lot of time informally with mentors as well. Like mentors don't have to have, be a formal relationship um, and they come and go. So somebody that might've been my mentor, you know, eight, nine, 10 years ago, you know, we might still be in contact, but it's sort of like that learning piece happens and then you move on to another part of your life or another part of your business. Um, so it's, it's for me, it's invaluable. Like I've got a really good network of entrepreneurs who I've met over the years through some have been clients, some have just been introductions. And again, it's not a formal networking group or a formal mentorship, but I know that I can pick up the phone and I can call them if I'm stuck or if I, you know, like I just need to download or I'm, I, you know, I need some advice in a certain area. I do have a, a good friend of mine who has four businesses and we do a, you know, a three hour walk and talk as often as we can. Um, and, and that's another great way, you know, because sometimes I need help, sometimes she needs help. Um, but either way, you sort of end that session and you're like, either feel like you've been beat up and, um, or, you know, you've just had a sounding board, uh, but a really valuable experience. Now you've mentioned you've got an advisor. Do you have a board of directors or advisors at the moment? No board of directors, um, but I work with my advisor quite closely on a sort of or weekly, monthly basis. Now, Sam, you're one of the few we've had on that's exited a business. Got any advice for the audience thinking about exiting one day? I don't feel, I, look, I feel like my exit 
was not that definitely wasn't a successful exit because the business ended up um business ended up folding um i think you know if i look at some of my successful clients who've exited businesses and you know we do a lot of pr with businesses where one of the reasons why they do it is because they want to build that brand presence that awareness that credibility piece because they're going through that process of selling um or being acquired it's making sure that you build a, a build a business that you can exit as quickly as possible i think um because you want to go and do something else as an entrepreneur but really making sure that you remove yourself from the day to day and that the business isn't all about you. All right, Sam, we're on our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? Um, I think I said this before, team. Yep. Team. I, and, you know, cash flow is obviously another big pain point, but I think team is is a big one. Favourite business book which has helped you the most? Um, so I spent the summer reading Atomic Habits by James Clear. Mm-hmm. Great which, book. Mm-hmm. I yeah. I, I, I tend to say that to people and they're like, yeah, I've read that book or you should read that book every 18 months just as a refresher. Um, yeah, really, really interesting book and it was a really good one to read while I was away. Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? Um, there's a really good podcast that I listen to called the No Bullshit Leadership yep. podcast. podcast. Um, again, I don't really listen to social ones, but that one I find is really easy to listen to if you're a leader, you're an aspiring leader, um, just really easy content, not too complex. I also like listening to Grant Cardone, uh, which my business advisor got me onto. Uh, that's quite brash and full on. But also sometimes I think when I need a bit of a kick up the ass, I like listen to that and I'm like, okay, like get on with it. Um, stop stop your whining and and move on. Have you listened to the Mark Boris, the mentor? Another one that we listen to um, and also have some of our great clients have been guests on that one as well. He's really good. I like his style. Uh, I think he swears slightly more than I do, but he's really laid back. Uh, I like his material. His material is great and he has a great producer. I'll g- give her a shout out, Jess Smalley. Um, she does an amazing job pulling that podcast together. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? Tool. Um, project management, well, project management tool is a must. So we use Trello. Mm-hmm. There are other project management tools out there, but then this one came from my former business advisor. Again, he was just like, well, wh- why are you like procrastinating on this? Want to grow? You can't do it without that. Yep. Finally, my favorite question, what would you tell yourself on day one of starting out 10 years ago? I would tell myself that I would need to delegate faster and bring in more experts around me in areas where I didn't have expertise in growing a business because that was a real challenge for me trying to do it all on my own. Right. Thanks very much for your time today, Sam. I'm sure we could go for a couple more hours. Really enjoyed chatting. Congratulations on the growth over the last 10 years, starting on your own to now 11 team members and helping a lot of great businesses and business owners out there get their their story and messaging out and uh, grow. Thanks for having me, Troy. Nice to finally chat. Yeah, Yeah, it was about three or four times, wasn't it? We finally got there. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, It's it's been fun. That's it. Thanks for listening. Please leave a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. It means more small business owners will find our cast and help people with their business growth journey.